good afternoon everyone to uh, cohort connect uh, first of all i'd like to thank all the students uh, who are here and also some of my colleagues uh, i'd like to extend a warm welcome to uh, dr vanita s rao uh, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, vanita um, she has a phd in autism spectrum disorders from st john's medical college bangalore and uh, i'll tell you a little bit more about you know how she actually uh, got into special education um well uh, you know i know uh, vanita almost all my life so i'm going to sort of trace that journey and i have already told her that there may be some errors you know some factual errors uh, so you know i mean i'm sure she will uh, give me that allowance <laughs> uh, okay so um, you know when uh, you know vanita graduated with a bsc degree uh, in uh, home science Uh, from mount carmel college in bangalore i mean after graduating she took up a regular job you know like most of us did at that point honestly we didn't have too many options back then uh, so after graduation we would get into jobs and then you know and uh, blunder our way through at least some of us uh, so vanita got into a regular job you know in an advertising agency if i'm not mistaken she stuck it yes. for a while over there and then decided to go back to study and went on to do her uh, msc so she did her msc in advanced human development with an additional paper in exceptional children so i guess that's where you know uh, her uh, you know uh, work with uh, children with special needs actually started if i'm not mistaken um and uh, she also has a couple of diplomas you know one in autism and another one in teachers training for learning disabilities now uh, coming back to her journey you know so she went on to do a masters degree and then uh, uh, she worked for a while in bangalore children's hospital and then i recall that you know i mean she started the sunshine nursery school and the first batch had uh, you know uh, uh, regular students i mean kids who started you know uh, play school uh, and uh, then from the second batch onwards she started including uh, you know uh, children with special needs and uh, incidentally my uh, niece who's 27 years old now was in the second batch uh, you know and uh, i remember there were some uh, kids uh, you know with special needs uh, and then it went on for a couple of years after which uh, uh, you know she's uh, turned it into a completely uh, special ed school um, and you know and this journey continued for a while um, and after that she moved to delhi for a year and you know worked uh, in tamana um, amana special school and then she moved back to bangalore and you know uh, started sunshine center for autism um, and she is a founder director uh, of sunshine uh, center for autism uh, and then you know she has been very involved uh, in uh, working with children with special needs and also uh, you know has worked with parents i mean i'm sure she will tell about uh, tell a little more about you know why she also works with parents uh you know because it's quite difficult for them to accept you know that they have children you know with special needs so her work has involved uh, involved children and uh, their parents and some of the parents actually started working with her you know that shows their involvement too and uh, after this she decided to you know uh, start uh, uh, working on a doctoral uh, degree and uh, uh, finally in uh, i think 2015 she was awarded a phd in autism spectrum uh, disorders so uh, you know one of the things that i find very inspiring is the fact that you know working with such children uh, i mean uh, actually it would be a blessing yes but also it is not easy and you know you don't make the pots of money that you know uh, people uh, generally expect i mean all of us when we look into a job or when we're looking for a job you know want that bit of remuneration and you know and are looking for titles which is fine i mean there's nothing wrong with that but in vani's case i mean she's been so involved with these children and you know and i recall her saying that you know she wouldn't you know want to charge a very high fee from parents who are already coping you know uh, you know with having you know children with special needs uh, so you know she always uh, you know did it more out of passion and compassion you know which was very inspiring for all of us you know having known her for all these years so that's uh, you know vani's journey and you know i'm sure she'll talk a little more about it as she goes on, goes along so uh, you know i'm sure we'll find this uh, uh, session very interesting uh, she's going to have some case studies that she will discuss and then you know you're all welcome to you know ask your questions so over to you uh, vanita thank you nandu that was a pretty long introduction 
and uh, only one factual error it was right from the first batch that i had uh, children with special needs i'm going to just start sharing so that i don't stop in between and then i can talk uh, i assume you can see the screen yes we can okay. so uh, you all can just stop me any time and ask questions if you wish Uh, I've just titled it developmental psychology and neuropsychology. These are two related fields, and for those of you who are uh, uh, not aware, basically when we talk about developmental psychology, we are talking about uh, how the uh, individual develops through the lifespan. Initially, when I started, like uh, Nandu said, years, years, and years ago, when we spoke about developmental psychology, we only mostly talked about young children. but today when they talk about developmental psychology they are talking about the entire lifespan and it covers even the elderly and then when you talk about neuropsychology it's more uh, the same thing human behavior but looking more at the neurological aspect of it okay so uh, let's just get started but first let me just of course thank uh, the organizers for inviting me today and nandu see i completely forgot to do that because you know the invitation was from nandu for me so it sort of slipped my mind there all right uh, is all right here we go so just to kind of set the stage for what we are talking about Uh, i have this quote by michio kaku i hope i am uh, pronouncing his name right the human brain has 100 billion neurons and each neuron is connected to 10000 other neurons so there sitting on your shoulders is the most complicated object in the known universe uh reason why i wanted to put this across right at the beginning is to tell you how complex the whole lot of human behavior is because it's these neurons that are you know uh controlling all the behaviors that we are doing and of course our development right from uh conception on right on till the time we actually pass on i'd like to actually begin by talking about tales of some extraordinary brains i'm sure a lot of you here would recognize these two images here uh we have the good doctor on one side and the big bang theory on one side i wanted to start with a little bit of fiction before going on to the facts because often fiction comes is derived from a whole lot of facts right so the good doctor here sean is a person on the autism spectrum with a lot of extraordinary abilities and he's able to you know just look at a person and figure out exactly where the blood vessels are going and where the nerves are going and what could be going wrong where and here on the other side we have sheldon cooper and his friends and one of the reasons i liked the serial a lot is because they actually uh, exemplify the entire you know the, the uh, neurodiversity of human uh, thinking because you have this brilliant uh, sheldon cooper with absolutely poor social skills not that the others have great social skills even leonard has very poor social skills in a different way and the same goes for the other two guys um rajesh kutrapali and uh, howard whereas there's penny with excellent social skills but uh, intellectually not as great as the others so i feel you know this kind of does illustrate a good neurodiverse environment so that's about the fiction and coming down to actual people who are having extraordinary brains uh, i'd like to actually start by talking about temple grandin there's this uh, you know these are the kind of uh, stories that really inspired me in the early years when i was uh, working with children this was something which uh, drew me to them because i had read a lot of books uh, Uh, i was someone who loved to read and one of the one of my favorite authors at that point of time was um, oliver sacks and he's written this uh, essay on temple grandin which he has titled an anthropologist on mars so what he was basically trying to 
indicate was here she was trying to understand she actually likes to uh, study more than human behavior she studies animal behavior but she has written a lot about autism because that's what uh, she has she is a person with autism uh, she is what people call an autistic savant meaning that the person has autism but has some extraordinary abilities along with her uh, difficulties in social communication so this lady is around maybe 74 75 today actually and uh, she's written books uh, like one of her very well known books is called thinking in pictures where she's spoken about how individuals on the autism spectrum actually think in pictures they are not able to think in words um she has a very poor verbal memory she has at the same time she has excellent non verbal intelligence and she has a doctorate in animal science so this this lady is somebody who actually opened the eyes to opened the special educator's eyes to what exactly goes on in a individuals with autism's mind because she's the one who to or let the world know exactly how they think and what would be a good way to teach them uh some scientists have had the good fortune of actually studying the mri of her brain and they have found a lot of differences with the uh with the normal controls that they compared the, her brain with uh, for instance they found that she has a larger than average size of the lobes both the lobes are larger than average and at, and very unusually the left lobe of her brain is larger than her right uh, lobe and then the areas which are responsible for language are poorly developed and there are fewer connections in the areas which are uh, responsible for processing phases now this fact that her brain is actually larger than average is something that has been seen in a lot of children with autism in fact there are even theories saying that it is a Uh, uh, uh the whole difficulty is due to a larger brain but of course because autism being a very very wide spectrum that has not held true for all individuals on the autism spectrum if i'm going too fast you can always stop me okay so another story i wanted to share with you is of a man um uh, stephen wilshire again on the autism spectrum again an autistic savant he is somebody with an excellent visual memory and he is an extraordinary artist all you have to do is take him up in a helicopter uh, let him ride around the city once and bring him back and supply him with drawing materials and he will draw the entire city scape down to the last window that is his capability his uh, visual memory is so great that it doesn't take much time for him to take in the entire cityscape recollect it and put it down on paper uh, he's done such uh, such a lot of good work that he's even been um, ordered he's been knighted by the uh, queen he's a britisher so i've got this little video clip that i could li- i would like to share with you of stephen wilshire uh, in at work now different from autism spectrum disorder the reason i'm sp- saying that is that there could be a lot of you here who are unfamiliar to this field down syndrome is a chromosomal disorder and uh, a person with down syndrome invariably has a lot of intellectual impairments what does that mean it means that the individual would have iq which would be below average while uh, most of us would probably function in the range of 100 uh, which is a bang on average iq and some of us may be 110 and some of us who are uh, fortunate may be a little higher uh, whereas most individuals with down syndrome would be somewhere 80 or lower very rarely would they have you know there could be a one or two who would have uh, say 85 which is on the higher end for a person with uh, down syndrome now lauren potter was also someone who had a lot of challenges which she uh, struggled with throughout her uh, youth and then she learned to dance 
She actually learned to walk around the age of two and very soon after that, she learned to dance. And she became, went on to become a disability ad advocate. In fact, she was one of the uh, advisors on disability in uh, Barack Obama's uh, government. So uh, she's someone with Down syndrome. And here's another person, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the papers regularly, a business magnet. And he, he's someone who really struggled through school. He uh, has dyslexia. What's dyslexia? That is a difficulty with the written word. Individuals with dyslexia uh, may, you know, see alphabets in the reverse, or they may have difficulty in making a letter sound association. Now, Richard Branson, despite all his challenges, and he dropped out at school at the age of 16, and went on to, you know, dabble in different things before he made it big. He started by uh, working on some sort of magazine in the early years. Then he would follow a lot of um, singers and write about them. Went on to start a record company, Virgin, uh, Virgin, what was it? Now it's called Virgin Atlantic. So he's somebody who's also a spokesperson for individuals with dyslexia. You'll find a lot of stuff out there where he talks about his difficulties. He talks about helping other people with such difficulties. Reason why I wanted to, you know, as I said, talk about all these stories was because these are the ones who actually got me interested in knowing what makes a person tick. What's with the brain which makes one person have so much difficulty in learning to read while another person might be excellent at reading, but having challenges elsewhere. So let's go on to look at that part. Let's talk about actual developmental neuropsychology. Now that we know a little bit about the different people that we, we deal with when we are in the field of neuropsychology. So developmental neuropsychology combines the fields of neuroscience. Neuroscience is nothing but the science that deals with the structure and function of the nervous system. There's your uh, spinal cord and there's your brain and all the neurons that go into it. So neuroscience teaches you about how each part, each structure, what it does, what it looks like, what is the physiology and uh, what is the function of that area. And then the other part that neuro, uh, developmental neuropsychology deals with is developmental psychology, how and why humans change over the lifespan. How, we, uh, how the person is conceived, how from we go from one little cell to becoming a completely formed human being and that little baby who's born, how that baby is born with um, not being able to walk, talk and how we grow from there to being a complete adult and how we further go on to age. And through all these uh, you know, stages of life, our brain is also undergoing some amount of change uh, where we first make all our neuronal connections till the age of eight, all our connections are getting strengthened. Then we grow up. Uh, there is a chance that for some of us, uh, all the, you know, what happens is some of the neurons which are not being used start getting pruned, start getting uh, uh, discarded. And yet for some, there is too much pruning happening and we may end up developing some sort of a mental health issue in the early years of, uh, of our adulthood. And then as we age, again, our mental development undergoes some amount of change. So developmental neuropsychology work uh, is the study of understanding all these changes. It examines the relationship between the brain and the behavior throughout the lifespan. It primarily deals with the study of children or individuals with developmental disorders as well, and also children with traumatic brain injuries. Uh, now here, the distinction is that when we say developmental neuropsychology, we're looking more at the younger children. Sorry? Mm, did someone ask a question? Okay, okay, true. 
Okay. Ridiman, can you mute? Uh, it's, uh, actually, uh... So, uh, I was just trying to make a distinction between neuropsychology and developmental uh, neuropsychology. Uh, the reason why I have put down the fact that we deal with uh, study of children is because if you say developmental neuropsychology now here, unlike developmental psychology, we're basically talking about only children. Whereas if you say neuropsychology, we would be uh, talking about the neuropsychology of adults. So basically the process of development doesn't run smooth always. Sometimes uh, for the very fortunate people, maybe it runs very smoothly. You walk, talk, uh, go to school all at the right time. Whereas for some people, things may not go as well. Like for instance, uh, whether it was Stephen Wilshire or Lauren Potter, things did not really go well. They were having delays. Uh, in the case of Lauren Potter, it would have been delays because she has intellectual impairment. Whereas in the case of Temple Grandin or Stephen Wilshire, there would have been differences because in some aspects of development, it would have gone on par with the others. Like for instance, Temple Grandin would have learn to walk probably around the age of one like everybody else, whereas she learned to talk much, much later. So that area of her brain was affected and she learned to talk much later. Now, development can be affected both genetically, uh, through genetically controlled uh, intrinsic factors, like, which you know combines with environmentally generated extrinsic factors to determine, I mean, uh, is what determines uh, development. Basically, what we're talking about here is nature versus nurture. A combination of nature and nurture go, uh, come about to affect our development. Uh, just a brief about when we talk about neuropsychology, what is it that we're looking at? We're looking at, and uh, you know, uh, testing is how we would best come to know what exactly we're looking at. So I've put down what, what all the things we can test. There's uh, intelligence, there's sensory perceptions, how we perceive the world around us. Uh, primarily, when we talk about perceptions, we are not talking about our ability to see, but our ability to make sense of what we see. And then there's language, there's executive function skills. Executive function skills are basically higher order uh, mental skills which help us to organize ourselves, to plan and sequence. For instance, when um, Nandu told me I need to do this uh, workshop, I had to decide, okay, what am I going to talk about? And uh, if I'm going to talk about neuropsychology, how do I want to start? What do I want to say next? And what do I want to end with? Now, all of this planning, sequencing is something which is controlled by my executive function skills. Then there's attention, the ability to listen to what somebody is saying. Now, I don't know about all of you. I find that my attention skills uh, in the virtual world is not as great as my attention skills would be in the real world. So our attention can differ even from situation to situation. And then, of course, our attention can differ from person to person. There are people who can pay attention endlessly. And there are people whose mind starts wandering and, you know, maybe they'll um, check their WhatsApp uh, messages while they're uh, listening to a talk. Or uh, maybe they will send a quick text message when they are doing something else. So attention can vary. Then there's memory. We have different kinds of memory. We have short-term memory. We have long-term memory. We have um, immediate memory. We have auditory memory and we have visual memory. So a lot of things go into our memory as well. And as you saw, um, Stephen Wilshire has, has excellent visual memory, whereas his verbal memory, not so good. In fact, poorer than most other people. Then, of course, another aspect is social skills or social cognition, understanding what the other person is thinking or feeling. Um, you know, a classic example here is Sheldon Cooper, who has very poor social cognition, despite 
all his uh, intellectual abilities. So coming to another core aspect of what we study in neuro, uh, developmental neuropsychology is the developmental disorders. All these things that I have been talking to you about, or the people I talk to you about, uh, there's intellectual impairments, there's autism spectrum disorder, there's learning disabilities, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, and cerebral palsy. Uh, I'm going to very briefly talk to you about each one. What is intellectual impairments? I've already spoken to you about uh, Lauren Porter, who has intellectual impairments. It's basically subnormal intelligence, that is below average intelligence. They have difficulties with adaptive behavior. So when we talk about um, below average intelligence, it just doesn't end with, you know, uh, the ability to finish school, say, for example. It also, you know, covers a whole lot more. Uh, to give you an example, say, uh, there is an intellectually uh, subnormal person waiting at a bus stop. The bus doesn't turn up. Uh, while an intelligent person immediately is able to, when I'm saying the word intelligent, I'm just talking about an average person. Here, an average person might be able to figure out, okay, now the bus hasn't come. Let me figure out another way to go. Whereas a person with intellectual impairment may not have the adaptive behavior skills to figure out another thing to do. They might actually get so overwhelmed by that situation that they may just remain sitting there till the, till the next bus comes or someone comes and helps them out. So that's what we mean by adaptive behavior, being able to adapt to anything new in a situation and get on with it. Uh, you know, the funny thing about this is you'll find that um, if you look out there now in the last one year, thanks to the pandemic, a lot of us have had to adapt. We've had to take on to working on the, uh, in the virtual world. If we did not adapt to this, we might get left behind. So that's where, again, our adaptive behavior has come into play. Then there are a whole lot of us who, uh, whether we like it or not, we do wear our masks when we step out. Whereas you will find a whole lot of people there whose adaptive behavior skills are maybe not so great. So they are still resisting putting on masks, even when they need to. So, you know, you can see the different spectrum of adaptive behaviors when you go out there. When you do something like I do, it becomes a habit for me to just look out there and start observing people and thinking, okay, so this one's probably having trouble with this kind of a thing. That's what I have kind of been doing over the years. Coming to the next disorder, autism spectrum disorder, as I was telling you about Temple Grandin and uh, Stephen Wilshire. What do they probably, uh, what do they mostly have a difficulty with? They have impairments in social communication and social interaction, along with restricted repetitive thinking. What this essentially means is that uh, even if they learn to talk, they might find it difficult to use that language to communicate with people. They might find it difficult to go out there and seek information or even give information. They find it difficult to uh, initiate a social interaction unless they are extremely comfortable with the person or they may not interact at all. And uh, when we talk about restricted repetitive thinking, what we mean is that um, they can be extremely rigid in the way they think. They may do something over and over again. They might uh, not be able to, again, adapt to a situation and do something differently. So all of these things go, go together to form autism spectrum disorder. And the individual with autism spectrum disorder may or may not have intellectual impairments. That is, it might go hand in hand with an intellectual impairment. But we find some nearly 70% of them do not have intellectual impairments. Even though when you interact with them, you might think they do. It could just be because of severe autism. And the next one, learning disabilities. Uh, these are basically difficulties in specific areas where they, despite having adequate intellectual functioning, they are having uh, difficulty in learning. Like it could be learning to read. 
I spoke to you about uh, Richard Branson and dyslexia. So dyslexia is when they have difficulty in learning to read. And this could be because of a visual perceptual difficulty, or it could be because of a auditory perceptual difficulty, or it could be a combination of both, meaning that the individual might have difficulty in looking at the letters and making sense of it. Maybe things appear reverse, like when they're looking at the word cat, it may actually look like T-A-C to them and instead of C-A-T. Or the small letter B might actually look like a D to them. That's when they are having visual perceptual difficulties. Whereas if they are having auditory perceptual difficulties, um, they may not be able to, you know, spontaneously tell you that the letter D makes the D sound. They may actually have difficulty connecting to that. And then there's another difficulty called dyscraphia, where they have difficulty in writing, forming the letters. Uh, they may be able to sometimes write the letters, but it will be all... Um, you know, different sizes, illegible. So dysgraphia is the difficulty in learning to write. And dyscalculia is the difficulty in learning to do arithmetic, making sense of numbers. Um, I strongly suspect I've had this huh? because I used to have struggle through my math class right up till the time I gave up math in college where uh, it just didn't make sense to me. And even today, if you are, you know, throw a uh, calculation at me, say, if you ask me what's 30 by uh, 20 or whatever, some number, I my mind will not even attempt it. It just shuts down and says, hang on, I'm getting the calculator. Whereas a lot of people will be able to just tell you immediately what it, um, multiply and tell you straight away. So this calculator is nothing but difficulty with numbers. Then we have attention deficit hyperactive disorder where people have poor attention. Uh, it may be a person with just poor attention or it may be a person with poor attention and is very hyperactive, not able to sit still. You'll find a lot of adults also when once, you know, once a ADHD child uh, becomes an adult, he or she may be able to control himself better but these will be the people who go on tapping the table, uh, shaking their foot when they are sitting, fiddling with something, fidgeting with something. So it could be the inherent hyperactivity which is coming out. And ADHD may be accompanied by learning disability or it may not. It could just be pure ADHD. Then we have cerebral palsy, which is a motor disability. Again, it's in the uh, in the... Um, motor area of the brain which is affected and the person may not be able to learn to walk. You will have different areas which are affected. They could be, um, you know, just the right side is affected or all the limbs are affected. And again, this may be accompanied by intellectual impairments or it may not. So again, it may be accompanied with speech difficulty or it may not. So we might have the entire neurodiverse uh, spectrum, which is all the variations in human behavior. Uh, I just thought I'll touch upon it briefly because uh, there's a lot about it out there where uh, there is the section of population which says, you know, uh, this is an entire spectrum, whether you are having or autism or learning disabilities, it's a, it's a spectrum along with the uh, so-called typical uh, human behavior and people should not be labeled, but they're just one part of the spectrum but that's you know that's something that you have to go out there and explore and see what you think about it whether you want to look at it as a disorder or a part of the neurodiverse uh, spectrum just to give you an idea of all of this well, i thought we could just play a few games to understand how each of us is different uh, you know when we are playing these games you can uh, discuss amongst yourself and see how each of you are faring out of, uh, with each part of the game that I'm uh, uh, you know, going to show you right now so that you get an idea of how each one is different in different ways in the way we think. Okay, So this is one test called the embedded figures test 
that we uh, use for an area of uh, neurocognition called uh, central coherence, where you know a person can make sense of the whole from a part. So we have this uh, figure on top, the question figure, and we have one, two, three, four answer figures. What you have to say is, uh, where does that question figure fit? Which one does it fit into? Does it fit into one, two, three, or four? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Two, option two. That's fantastic. Someone who does it this quickly uh, is probably someone with extremely good ability to see uh, minute details of a figure. Why is this not moving forward? One second. Okay, here we go. There's another one. Anyone want to give it a try? Option one. Option one. Good. Now I have something else. This is social cognition. Uh, just looking at these eyes, what would you say he's feeling? Despondent. Despondent. Hey, we got good people here. Yep. Despondent. So actually the reading the mind in the eyes test consists of a series of such images where you have to choose what the person is feeling. And, you know, when you do the entire test, the ones who score higher are the ones who are very good in social cognition. And you'll find individuals on the autism spectrum are extremely poor at this. Uh, the previous test that I showed you, the embedded figures, individuals with autism are extremely good at it. So you'll find that there are these differences. Here's another one. You want to try this? Left one. Bold. Any other answers? Comforting. Any more? Playful. Yep, playful it is. This one? Interested. 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 Everyone agrees on that. Yes. Interested. Now here, this is a different test. Uh, can you tell me what color this is? Red. 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 Black. Black. Yeah. So this is a test which, uh, you know, you're supposed to present these rapidly. Like, tell me what color this is. Blue. 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 What word is this? Yeah. Blue. 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 Okay, I heard a yellow there as well. So now you're supposed to present these rapidly to see what answer the person gives. You can uh, first ask the person for the color and then the very next time ask the person for the word. And you'll find some people find it difficult to stop themselves and switch over and give the different uh, the next answer like you know initially if i've been asking you the color and then then i suddenly ask you what word is this there's a tendency to still say the color or sometimes when you see this uh, even at the first go when i say what color is this some people might actually say black okay so uh, this test is something that you see to uh, you test to see if uh, the person is able to inhibit their responses quickly and switch over when someone is uh, switching the rule. So that's called the Stroop test. All these tests that I'm showing you are the um, actually the adult versions. You have children, uh, child versions for the same, where uh, maybe for the reading the mind in the eyes, we would give uh, simpler words. And again, for the embedded figures, we would give simpler figures. I have one more here. Maybe all of you could uh, go through these 10 questions and uh, uh, decide for each statement. Do you strongly agree 
slightly agree, slightly disagree, or strongly disagree. I give you, say, about five minutes to finish that, and then we can score ourselves and see where we are at in our sensory perception. The first one to finish can tell me that you finished. Done. Okay, two participants have finished, I think. They've raised their hands. Any more to complete it? Should I move on to the scoring? Yeah. Okay, y'all can score yourselves. I'll put the scoring on. You give yourself three points for every time you've said strongly agree, two points for slightly agree, one point for slightly disagree, and zero points for strongly disagree, and then you total all your points. Ma'am, can you show the previous screen again? Total your scores. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So you can see now uh, they 
higher the scores that you've got on this, uh, the more sensitive is your, you know, your, the more sensitive you are. In the sense, when I when I talk about sensitive here, I'm talking about the sensory perception being more uh, keenly uh, tuned. Okay, so most individuals on the autism spectrum tend to be uh, well; they can fall either way. Either they will be hypersensitive, or they may be even hyposensitive. They won't be falling in between where uh, like the average person. Most average people would fall somewhere in the middle. Look for this. Neither too sensitive nor too um, hyposensitive. So this gives you the entire spectrum of sensory perception that you can see in uh, see in the human population. So higher scores are indicative of high degree of sensory sensitivity. So come to the end here now. Thank you for your patient listening. Anyone have questions? You may turn on your uh, videos. I'll just stop sharing, I think. So we can just discuss. A few of them. Any questions? Actually, your questions don't have to be on this topic alone. It could be on, you know, I mean, even uh, things to do with, you know, um, career paths coming out of what you study. I know there are quite a few of you here who are interested in psychology and biology. Ma'am, I had a doubt. And I wanted to ask her. Tell me. So, uh, is there any kind of, are there any kind of symptoms which are clearly visible to everyone, which shows the signs of an autistic person? Like, uh, if we kind of have a conversation with that person, we will automatically, yeah, know that, uh, yeah, he's, he has signs of some aut autistic, he's, a, he's an autistic person. Well, there will be signs, but I am not sure whether everybody will make out that it's autism. Uh, one primary thing that most people, um, you know, use for diagnosis for autism is the fact that they make poor eye contact. Okay. But then again, a person who makes poor eye contact need not necessarily be someone with autism. Uh, he or she could be making poor eye contact due to some other mental issue. Okay. Yes. So one of the things is poor eye contact. Uh, the other could be that some of them have uh, what we call body stereotypes. They may be flapping their hands or rocking a lot. Okay. So uh, there are a few features which are evident. But then again, it would require a skilled professional to decide whether this is autism or these features are due to some other issue. But yeah, you can say that the person is having some issue. So it ultimately depends on the psychologist. Like if uh, the psychologist says that... Ideally, uh, yes. Yes, ideally it should be someone who uh, takes all the features into account. Okay? okay. Because okay. there could be some features which overlap with some other uh, disorder. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Vani, I have a question. If yeah. a parent approaches you... Uh, you know, uh, with a child, I mean, how do you diagnose? I mean, what are the tools that you use? Uh, the tools that I use now will depend on the age of the child. If I get a child who's around, say, uh, 18, 19 months, then the first thing that I would administer is a 
checklist called modified uh, checklist for autism in toddlers okay where we check out uh, is the child able to point to objects does he look when he when you point so uh, these are the uh, some of the items in the questionnaire which we would check uh, so that would be one tool that i would use then i have another tool called the vineland adaptive behavior checklist this is a checklist which checks out uh, the child's behavior in all areas of development language within language we look at receptive language expressive language that is what he understands what he's able to speak uh, how does he interact uh, how does he uh, play we look at all of these areas through this checklist which is a parent questionnaire before we conclude so ideally if the child is 18 months i would use both the tools i would also observe the child using that same checklist mentally i would be observing is he able to point is he able to uh, you know understand when i point does he look at me then i would give him a few uh, what we call developmental assessments okay uh, a developmental assessment is when we decide um in the cognitive area is he able to do this 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 in the fine motor area is he able to do this 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 so we come to a developmental age like that so we would use this for a young child as the child grows older we have different tools like uh, we might actually go on to using uh, iq tests if the child is about a uh, 4 and a half 5 you know before 4 and a half 5 we would use developmental tests after 4 and a half 5 we would use iq tests again for autism we have different uh, uh, tools that we use we have something else called uh, social responsiveness scale uh, we have something called uh, the ados i personally don't use the ados but that's the uh, autism diagnostic uh, observation schedule i personally don't use it because it costs a bomb simple as that <laughs> if i pay a bomb to buy it i'll have to charge the parents a bomb uh, so i i i don't see the sense in doing that so i use uh, what shall i say a non patented version of it not a registered trademark i just use my own skills the check the items in it are the same but i have not paid for the ados so kind of does that answer your question nandu yeah yes it did yeah any other questions one second i just need to open this i see a question in the chat box yeah that's lovely that's a uh, very good question there uh, see uh, lauren potter has a lot of yes she has a lot of intellectual difficulties as i said she has down syndrome and the remarkable thing about uh, individuals with down syndrome is socially they are very very good she was able to do this and this is something you'll find you know when you look out there a lot of individuals with down syndrome have actually taken to acting and modeling because this area seems to be something that they are able to do what they have difficulty here is memorizing the dialogues which i think uh, you know people do help them out and they really struggle to memorize the dialogues uh, they would have difficulty in reading and memorizing maybe someone will have to call it out to them and then they memorize it but uh, socially they are so good they are able to pick up this and uh, do uh, you know get into acting roles pretty well i don't know whether i have answered that question because it's 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 actually a very fascinating thing but that's how they are individuals with uh, down syndrome that again you know shows how not all parts of the brain are affected there for her there is some some skills that she has thank you yeah. okay i have a question because probably i've been you know involved in your work to some extent at least some years back you know, not off late and you know we've been discussing a few things you know and i've lost touch in between uh, about rehabilitation you know or in the sense of you know with adults with autism i mean i know you deal mostly with children you know but after they uh, you know grow beyond a certain point what do you do i mean not you uh, or generally uh, you know what uh, 
happens with those uh, people you know as adults vocational training or you know i mean we'll throw some light on that okay uh yeah i will get back to rishita in a minute let me answer nandu's uh, question uh, so now autism is an entire spectrum so you'll find that there are people who have done very well in fact currently i have a couple of them who are in college and uh, okay bumbling through like many of us if i may use the word because all of us did that too in a sense uh, in their case maybe the uh, challenges are a little different uh, but then there are some who are in college there are others who need to be in vocational training centers sadly enough they the number of vocational centers to the number of individuals on the autism just doesn't match up there are many people who are still at home and um, again very sadly this is one of the reasons why you know if uh, like when nandu called me and said she wants me to talk i jumped to it because this is something a lot of us in the field feel that there aren't enough people getting into it today or uh, like nandu mentioned initially money can be a factor money is i i completely understand that not all of us uh, can ignore that aspect but again you know there are ways that we can figure it out and look for opportunities uh, there is something like trying to be a social entrepreneur you can look at funding and see whether you can do something like this because there aren't enough centers for the number of individuals who are still struggling so we don't have centers for vocational training we recently have got one college in mumbai which is doing uh, training for adults with all kinds of difficulties it's basically like a polytechnic where they're training them to be um, bakers and uh, training them to be waiters that kind of a thing uh, but that's one in our country can you believe that one college uh, the rest of them either get a round pegs being beaten into square holes trying to get into regular colleges or sitting at home simple as that just sitting at home so we need that we need a lot of uh, more uh, help out there then there are those who need assistance all their life and we have very few centers taking care of them after the death of their parents most of the centers are pathetic very frankly uh, very few which have a humane treatment we don't have humane treatment for uh, able adults where are we going to find humane treatment for people who have difficulties yeah uh rishita says ma'am is there a way to know about neurological syndromes before the birth of a baby uh yes for some no for most of them we do have a test to find out if the child has got down syndrome or certain other chromosomal uh, anomalies but we do not have a way to find out whether the child is going to have uh, say autism or learning difficulties uh we will know only as the child develops any other questions thank you ma'am welcome are there uh, no more questions hey um so thank you vani uh, for sparing time and you know i mean sharing Spend all this with us uh, you know it took me back some years because we have not worked together or you know done much on this front for a long long time i mean uh, for the others here you know uh, i also i mean we were all in bangalore together and then i moved out about 20 years ago and i have not lived in bangalore for a long time but when uh, vani started you know uh, her venture i was there you know to support in some small ways i remember her having these you know children's day parties for these kids and uh, diwali parties and you know so i would actually take a day off and you know go and spend time with them uh, but then uh, unfortunately you know i have not been able to do it in the last uh, almost 20 years so uh, hopefully you know i'll get back to it now that i'm in chennai and you know that's closer to bangalore um so uh, thank you to the students you know who are here and i hope you found this uh, interesting um, and we will bring you more such uh, you know talks and workshops Uh, if you all want something specific, you can email us at admissions at you know sai university 
edu.in and, uh, and tell us you know if there's something else that you want to uh, you know look into uh, and we can try to bring those speakers also it will be good to hear from you rather than you know us foisting everything on uh, you all um, so uh, we'll stop with that uh, thank you again mummy and uh, we'll be in touch yeah mama uh, i had one question rishita this side yeah uh mom i wanted to know how can i get involved in this ngo work or helping this helping these children in delhi because i am based in delhi as of now so how can i participate well you could check out the ngos closest to you and uh, see whether they um, you know require any voluntary service you could do that uh then you know sometimes people even uh, volunteer their services online like creating brochures or you know you could look at different avenues actually going there and helping them out physically or doing other kind of help like uh, helping them raise funds or um, creating something for them to use to raise funds you could do this kind of a thing as well so uh, there are many things you just Uh, wherever you are staying you know look around i'm sure you'll find some ngo close by uh, you can just walk in there and ask them what kind of service they would like thank you ma yeah. there's one question i wasn't able to actually uh, reply properly on chat uh, with amniocentesis can we find the neurological problems again not all of them we can find some of the more grosser uh, difficulties but the subtler things like um, learning difficulty or even asd uh, autism spectrum disorder may not be uh, diagnosed through amniocentesis it's only done once the child is born and we start seeing the differences in the development thank you all right uh, shall we close it here uh, students please do give us your feedback on uh, the admissions uh, email uh, address and uh, uh, you know and let us know what you think of it and if you want any more such sessions and what else you want uh, so uh, thank you vani and uh, we'll be in touch thank you nandu thank you everybody for a patient listening